Certainly, if I should say this afternoon, if you have your Bibles, and you'd open them, please, to Luke chapter 8. Luke, the Gospel of Jesus Christ, according to the Apostle Luke, chapter 8, beginning at verse 49. It's toward the end of the chapter. And we're going to read through the end of the chapter. It's just seven verses. If you stand in honor of the reading of God's Word, <clears throat> and I'll read the primary text to you today from the New King James Version for clarity. While he was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Do not be afraid, only believe, and she will be made well. When he came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John, and the father and mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her, but he said, Do not weep, she is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. Knowing! <laughs> but he put them all out, took her by the hand, and called, saying, Little girl, arise. Then her spirit returned, and she arrived immediately. Where's the life? In the spirit. Do you see? And he commanded that she be given something to eat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. I bet you you're never going to guess where I'm going with this today. I want to speak to us this afternoon on the topic of you know what? You know what? Amen. Master, we love you today. We thank you, God, for yet another opportunity to be in the house of God. We thank you for your promise. Lord, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. King Jesus, this hour we come before you humbly. For, Lord, we need to hear from you. No one has come into this place. No one will listen to this message by tape that does not want to hear from heaven. They're not interested in the opinions and ideas of moral. They're interested in a word from God. Lord, you've called us to a prophetic ministry, and therefore this hour, God, it's my responsibility to declare, Thus saith the Lord at this time for this people, for those that would hear this word, God, let your anointing flow this hour like a mighty river of warm oil. God, allow it to touch the hearts and lives of each and every individual sitting in this place, those that would hear by take. Lord, allow it to touch me and flow through me, that every word might find its mark, God, and that the hearer might know that this is the truth. For we ask it, O oh God, today in the wonderful name of Jesus, amen. Praise God and amen. You know what? You ever had somebody walk up to you and start a conversation with, you know what? You may be seated. You know what? You know what? I find it interesting in this story, Jarius had gone, he was a ruler in the synagogue, and Jarius had gone to find the Lord because his daughter was sick. Before Jarius could get the Lord back to his home, Another person with another need had interrupted the Lord's journey, causing him to be delayed just a little while, but that little bit of time seemed to have cost him the miracle he was looking for. Because before they could get back to his doorpost, it appeared as though his daughter had died, and someone from the synagogue came running to tell him, Jarius, don't bother the rabbi any further because your daughter is dead. How many times we need God to do something for us and we see him seem like he stops so he can do something for somebody else 
And then it looks like our miracle goes down the drain because he was so busy helping this one over here that he couldn't get to me in time. Amen. You remember the story of the woman that had an issue of blood for 12 years? Well, that's the little lady who had delayed the Lord in his journey to Jairus' house. That's the little lady who needed her miracle, in her mind anyway, more quickly and more badly than did Jairus. But you know what? The wonderful thing is, as the old black preacher said, God's God when he gets there. Amen. God is God when he gets there. Don't worry about if the Lord is delayed. Don't worry about if things aren't going as quickly as you had planned. Don't worry about if things aren't happening just the way you would like them to happen. When God gets on the scene, it, the job will be done. Amen. He'll get the job done. He is God when he gets there. It doesn't matter if the circumstances appear to have grown worse and worse and worse. It doesn't matter because God is God. God when he gets there. Amen. Now, I bet you think I'm going to preach a little message about miracles and blessings and things of this sort, but you know what? You're wrong. No, I want us to focus for a moment on people who can laugh at God. People who could laugh in the face of Jesus and laugh him to scorn because they knew something he didn't. Or at least they thought they did. But Jesus just turned and started heading for that bedroom that day. And inside his spirit he said, you know what? You know that she's dead? Oh, you know what? Said, I'm here to tell you she not but taking a nap. <laughs> Are you crazy, fool? We know that she's dead. Honey, you don't know nothing if Jesus hasn't said it. Hallelujah. If God hasn't declared it so, then it isn't so. And what you think you know may not be what you know. Come on now. We need to know what God knows and stop knowing what we think we know. Hallelujah. Well, my Lord, have mercy. There are a lot of people in the church world today that look this way this morning and say, well, I know that the people in that building are lost and unsaved. I know that people of this orientation or that orientation are lost and I'm done without God. I know there's no hope for them. I know this. I know that. And Jesus comes in and says, hey, she is not dead. She's merely taking a nap. Hallelujah. What you think you know is not what he is. Hallelujah. Because God, in the final analysis, is the one who says what is and what is not. My Lord, have mercy. Because he's the one who's able to make what he says a reality. See, when the Lord said she is not dead but merely sleeps, he had the power and the authority to make that statement a reality. Amen. It's one thing to talk when you ain't got nothing to back it up. It's another thing to say something when you're coming from a divine perspective. And Jesus was looking at that little girl through divine eyes with a divine perspective. The reason that we cannot see as God, uh, we cannot see God as being able to do what is for us impossible it's simply because we do not share his perspective. We often don't think we can be saved because we're part of the GLBT community. But honey, I've got news for you. We're not looking at this thing the way God does. Amen. 1 Corinthians 2.14 declares that the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You see, the natural man cannot even fathom God sometimes. As a matter of fact, sometimes the natural man gets angry with God for the way God does things. Amen. Look at old Jonah. 
Lord spoke to Jonah and said, I want you to go to Nineveh. Jonah said, I don't want to go to Nineveh. It's an evil city. It's a wicked city. I don't want to go kill those bunch of heathens that you're going to destroy them. God said, Jonah, I will not destroy them without first there being a warning. I need you, my prophet, to go warn them. Well, Lord, talk to somebody else because I don't want to go. You know the story. Jonah begins to hop a ship over to Tarsus, and what happens? He winds up in the midst of a storm, and realizing the storm is probably God's way of getting his attention, Jonah suggests to the others on the boat that they throw him overboard, and they do, and he winds up in the belly of a whale, and after a period of time, the whale throws him up on the shores of Nineveh. Honey, I'll tell you what. <laughs> you don't want to do what God tells you to do when He asks you to do it. You sure enough don't want Him to give you a ride. Amen. <laughs> there He is. So now He's mad. Well, now God has put me through a three-day journey in the belly of a stinky old whale, seaweed around my neck. Now I'm mad. I'm going to let these people know they're going to split hell wide open. But now I'm going to be glad to do it. <laughs> yes, Lord, I didn't want to come before, but after three days in the belly of a whale on account of these perverts and weirdos and ungodly things, I'm just thrilled to tell them you're going to squash them. But then what happens? The people of Nineveh repented, and they <laughs> dug themselves out in sackcloth and ashes and turned their face toward the Lord and said, Lord, we're sorry that we've offended you. And what happened with Jonah? Was he a preacher like today that would be excited and thrilled for the revival that God sent? No, he was mad at God for saving him instead of destroying him. Why? Because the natural man cannot discern the things of the Spirit, for they are spiritually discerned. If Jonah, the, Jonah, the, if Jonah had had any sense, he would have known that God was sending him to Nineveh for the purpose of revival. If Jonah had been looking through God's eyes, if he'd been looking with a divine perspective, then Jonah would have been going to Nineveh for the purpose of revival. How many preachers get up every Sunday to preach, and they're not preaching from a divine perspective? Amen. They're just like Jonah. They're letting you know God's going to throw you into a hot hell, and they're happy to tell you. Because they're not coming from a divine perspective. They're happy to tell you that you're lost and hopeless, that your lifestyle and who you are as an individual and things you say and do bar you from eternity with God, and they're glad to tell you, but they're not coming from a divine perspective. They're not seeing as God sees because they're not looking through the eyes of the Spirit. They're looking through the natural carnal eyes of men. When Samuel saw the new king to replace Saul, who had grossly displeased the Lord, he was told to go to the house of Jesse, where one of Jesse's seven sons would be God's choice to be anointed the new king over Israel. In 1 Samuel 16, verses 6 through 7, we read, And it came to pass when they were come that he, meaning Samuel, looked on Elihad and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Samuel thought, Surely Elihim is the new king. Surely this young, strapping, handsome man is the next man to be king. God said, No, I've rejected this one. Keep looking. 
don't get caught up in appearances, honey. Because it's men who gets caught up in appearances. I'm not looking at appearances. I'm looking at the heart. How many people are going to churches today because they put up a good front? They've got a good music program. They've got a good ministry. And yet the reality is the heart of the ministry is rotten to the core because there's a preacher up there who's only there for the paycheck. How many people send their money in and follow after half these TV preachers? And they get all caught up in feeling like they're part of something big because man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. See, big preachers with these big ministries collecting big money, let me tell you something, honey. You may think you're fooling somebody. You may be fooling somebody, but you're not fooling God. You can play your games all you want to. When you stand before the Lord in the judgment, I've got news for you. You will answer for your crimes. You will answer for your offenses. If you don't think that stealing the widow's might and claiming that God is going to bless her so greatly because of you having such a great and wonderful ministry, she needs to send her last dime your way. If you think for two seconds that stealing that widow's last penny is not going to cost you in, in, in glory, I've got news for you. It will, because you can fool everybody around here, but you cannot fool God. But now look at the promise of the Messiah as it was spoken of by Isaiah in Isaiah 53, 1 through 3. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Now this is God speaking of the Messiah, the Christ. He said, He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see Him, there is no beauty that we should desire Him. You see, God did not make the Lord so physically attractive that people would be drawn to Him simply on the external premise of His appearance. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Listen to me now. Seldom does God do great things using great people or great organizations. It is his pleasure to use the lowly, the lowly esteemed, and the downtrodden. For in so doing, he is able to assure that he alone will be given the glory by not only the individuals being used and blessed by him, but also by those who witness what he has done through them. Amen. God don't use big organizations. A lot of times, sweetheart, I've got news for you. Once your little ministry has gotten to that place, and once it's gotten so big, Mr. Hen... You become obsolete. Everybody talking. I love watching on TV all these preachers talking about, Oh, the Lord told me I'm going to have a new anointing. I'm going to have a great new anointing coming. Baloney, you liar. What you're going to have is a replacement. Amen. God don't have time to be glorifying you and lifting you up and deifying you your entire life, Mr. Man. No, sir. What you're going to have is a replacement. Saul had a replacement. His name was David. Saul has slain his thousands, but David is ten thousands. The people of Israel cried, I've got news for you, Mr. Hayes. You've got a replacement out there. And if you were really in the spirit, you'd know it. And you'd step aside and make room for the younger generation to fill the shoes that you have created, as it were. But you see, it's unfortunate that people don't have God's perspective. 
and they're not looking through God's eyes. They think they know something, when in reality, they know nothing. The Apostle Paul was one of the greatest men ever used by God. Yet he was not even one of the original twelve. Nor was he, by his own admission, perfect or complete. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9, Paul said, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me. Lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, three times, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. In Philippians 3, 9 through 14, listen to what the Apostle Paul writes. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained. I there were already perfect. Now this is a man, one of the greatest men of God in, in the entire New Testament age. And he's saying, I don't want you all to think that I've already attained or that I'm already perfect. He said, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Now listen to this. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. He said, I don't consider myself to have gotten there yet. But this one thing I do, that I haven't gotten there yet, but this is the one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. One of God's greatest soldiers, the Apostle Paul, clearly admits, so far I've given you two places in Scripture where he clearly admits his humanity. He clearly admits his frailty. He clearly admits his imperfection. Romans 7, verse 22 through 25, Paul said, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am! Well, I'll tell you what, I've known hundreds of preachers in my day, and I'll guarantee you, out of all the preachers I've ever known, I can't even imagine three that would ever look at themselves in the mirror and honestly say, oh, wretched man that I am. And yet this was the Apostle Paul. Hey, Amen. There's not one of us worms out here that can even begin to fill his shoes. That man helped to clarify the gospel of Jesus Christ for the entire Gentile world from the beginning of the gospel to the end of this dispensation. Who can compare to him in scope of ministry and, and effect an effectiveness. And yet Paul says, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Whew. I'll tell you what, Tommy, if the Apostle Paul was standing in church today, and most churches got up and gave a testimony, and it sounded anything like what I just read, he'd be kicked out. Because you're not perfect enough, and you're readily admitting you've got something in your spirit, you've got something in your flesh that displeases God, you're admitting that you've got sin in your life. Oh.
If one were to look carefully at the motley crew that this whole thing we call the Christian faith was built upon, we would see that this principle I've spoken of today is not sometimes true, but always true. God doesn't use great people. He doesn't use great organizations. He always uses the lowly. He always uses the downtrodden. Those are those he can work with. Thus, why do you think he picked a hot-tempered fisherman like Peter? Why do you think he picked the sons of thunder? Amen. Why do you think he picked a tax collector that everybody hated? By reason of the job he did, which somebody had to do it. Perhaps you are where you are today because of the glory and the blessing that God has planned for your tomorrow. Hold on. Don't quit. The sun is coming up in the morning. Hallelujah. Men like to look at what the Lord spoke to Samuel. Here's a warning. As a license to act as you will and do as you please. And as an affirming minister or not, I have to tell the truth. While it's easy to get enraptured by the last half of 1 Samuel 16, 7, which declares God looks on the heart, we err if we fail to recognize that the first portion of that verse has an equally powerful truth. Man looks upon the outward appearance. Amen. You can't expect man to see your heart. He can't. So if you act in a fool, amen, and then say, well, I wonder why my testimony ain't bringing people to Jesus. I wonder why my, you know, my testimony ain't bringing people in by the dozens. Well, it's because you acted like a fool. Well, but that shouldn't matter. Man was on the with the God was on the heart. Well, honey, how many gods do you think there are running around? Amen. Our lives as believers are dedicated to living as individuals who have a dual citizenship. But to use that dual citizenship to break the laws and behave unseemly is to disgrace the nation which you call home and the government which you represent. Amen. The Russian diplomats working at the United Nations in New York City some years ago uh, were accused of reckless parking. Every time you turned around, they were parking their Lincolns and their... Uh, limos and everything where they shouldn't be parking them. And next thing you know, they'd get a ticket, but they didn't pay the ticket. They wound up with a huge pile of tickets, and they said, we're not going to pay them. They just ignored the, the fines and ignored the tickets, and they refused to pay the huge number of parking fines that they had accrued, claiming diplomatic immunity. See, they figured they could get away with, after all, I've got citizenship in another country. I'm here as a diplomat. Therefore, I can do whatever I didn't well want to do. I've got diplomatic immunity. And there was a huge problem between the federal government, which was trying to say to the city of New York, let it go, let it go, don't make an issue of it. And the city of New York saying, no! If we let this go, these people will keep parking the way they're parking. They hold up traffic. They tie up streets. They make it uh, inconvenient for everybody in the city of New York to get around and move and do what they have to do. We can't ignore this. They need to pay their tickets just like everybody else. But see, there's a lot of Christians that want to act like stoonards and they wonder why the world isn't moved by their testimony. Amen. But you know what? While it is true, God looks on the heart, don't forget, man looks on the outward appearance. Now, I have good news for you in that regard. And that is this today. You will never have to earn 
the love and grace of God. Amen. You'll never have to, and, and that's not what I'm trying to say. But listen up now. Galatians 5, verses 13 through 26. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. But by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the, lust, for the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that they cannot do the things that ye would. We're talking about divine perspective. What do you know? Jesus knew that little girl when dead, she'd just taken it out. Because from his perspective, that's exactly what she was doing. And what Paul is telling us here in Galatians is that if we walk in divine perspective, rather than in a natural, earthly, fleshly perspective, we will not be devouring one another. We will not be consuming one another. Hello now. That's what he just said. He said, for the flesh lusteth against the Spirit. If we'll allow the Spirit of God to give us the eyes and mind of Christ. I love when people say, I love the sinner, hate the sin. I say, honey, if you love the sinner, you wouldn't see the sin. Amen. My Bible said, love covers a multitude of sin. If you love that person as much as you claim to, you wouldn't see the sin. Every time you looked at them, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be thinking about their, quote, homosexuality. Every time I sit down and visit with my Uncle Eddie before he finally was able to kick the bottle, kick the habit, I didn't sit down and visit with Uncle Eddie every time, Mother, and think, about the drug, the drunkard that he was, about the number of ac accidents he'd been in, about the alcoholic that he was, about the troubled relationship with his wife and children that he had. I didn't look at him that way. He was my uncle and I loved him. I looked at him like my uncle. Some people can't look at me or can't look at you, but that they've got to draw all kinds of images and pictures of who you are and what you do. Why? I tell you why. Because they don't have the divine perspective. And the problem is what they think they know isn't what they know at all. My Lord, have mercy. We do not strive today to live right or righteously in an effort to earn salvation, God's love, or His favor. We do not strive to earn those things. But we do strive to live right and righteously in an effort to permit our light to brightly shine in the midst of a wicked world so that lost humanity may be pointed to the Christ of Calvary, not by our words, but by our lives. Amen. You see, that's why we recognize man looks on the outward, but God looks on the heart. And we take both statements to be equally important. Because man's looking on that word. And if my testimony is going to have anything to say to him, all he's going to see is what I do externally. So that's why I pray, Lord, help me to live right. Help me. Is God going to condemn me if I fail? Is God going to condemn me if I slide, if I slip? No. But guess what? Your testimony is going to lose credibility with people around you. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that's where the difference lies. It's in where we're trying to make a difference and where we're trying to have an impact. The Lord's unfailing love, grace, and favor were gloriously displayed with outstretched arms on the brutal cross on Golgotha's hill. You never have to earn that. You're never living to earn God's favor. 
by a pile of rules and regulations. Honey, you don't have to earn God's favor. God knows you. He knows exactly who you are. Even Dennis the Menace had parents that loved him. Amen. You can take the most wicked little booger of a kid, and you know what? His mom and dad love him. The rest of the world may, can't stand him, but his mom and dad love him. I've got news for you. Your Heavenly Father understands you. He knows you. He loves you. Now, that's not to say it's going to make everybody else in the world love you because he does. No, if you want everybody else in the world to love you, you've got to act right. You've got to let your light shine. It is an insult. I'm sorry, Romans 14, verses 12 through 19. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us therefore not judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know, listen to what Paul said, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. That's why I say, if you think homosexuality is wrong, then you better remain heterosexual till the day you die. Amen. Because if you esteem it unclean, then to you it is unclean. Amen. He says, But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, destroy not him with thy meat, for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. You see, there's that dual thing going on here. He said, you, you want to be accepted with God and at the same time approved of men. Because your testimony is shining. He said, let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. I began to say a moment ago, it's an insult to compare personality traits or learned behaviors and our own ability or our own unwillingness to rein in our actions and behaviors and compare those things to natural expressions of one's human condition. For example, just try telling a black man in America that you, a white person, understand his lot and struggles in life because your sister's, brother-in-law's, cousin's, nephew's, stepfather was American Indian and you remember various things he had spoken of regarding prejudice he experienced. Now, do you see what an idiotic comparison it is? How are you going to compare yourself to understanding a, a person of color's experience in America today when you're talking about somebody 85 times removes the experience and all you did was heard a few stories about it? But you see, we got people today that want to act wrong and do wrong and misbehave, as it were, and then say, well, it's the same as somebody being gay. I just was born this way. Amen. People will do it. You've got to be careful. That's an insult. The same is true when one tries to compare the struggles and torments that a gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgendered individual goes through trying to come to terms with who they are with an individual who refuses to dress appropriately for various situations. You know, the girl who goes to church in a tank top and says, well, I just got to be me. It's just like everybody else. I mean, you know, gay people feel like they just got to be me. Well, excuse me, darling. Wait a minute. There's a huge difference between struggling and wrestling with an issue for years of your life to finally come to terms with this is who I am and being a little slut puppy who can't dress decent no matter where you go not even if it's to church or to you know to a classy event or something nice you know there's a difference we, you know we've got to remember children let's use wisdom there's a difference Hebrews 12 4 through 17 the Apostle Paul again is credited with saying, Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. 
and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof are all, all our partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no, chast no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous.